Kyocera is a uh, manufacturer, Japanese company, Kyoto Ceramics, and we um, are very diversified. Our, the, the core is uh, ceramic technology and microchip uh, uh, packaging, but we're also in the solar um, uh, cell phones and copiers and printers and a whole bunch of other stuff. We started in solar in 1975. Kyocera was actually the entity that came up with uh, ma mass manufacturing of the uh, photovoltaic cell, polycrystalline photovoltaic cell, and uh, it's what's normally used today. Um, that was like um, in, 19, in the 1970s. And um, we have, uh, we're all over the world. Um, I've been with Kyocera for 13 years, so I've seen the changes before the solar initiative even. Um, before I start, how many of you know what this, uh, or heard about the solar initiative, the CSI program? Okay, so not very many people. Um, my topic is gonna be distribu uh, distributed generation. And the challenge I have personally is that RPS in generally means large scale, utility scale. And I believe that there is a, a, a terrible uh, wasted opportunity that we have in not focusing on distributed generation. And I'm gonna address that. Yeah. So DG, this is the, the load, this is the house. I'm gonna call it the load in te technical terms, so I'm <laughs> not very technical. Um, and people put it on top of the roof or you can put it around here or around here. So DG is, in my, uh, my definition, is gonna be from energy that goes from here, um, maybe over here. This is for the California Solar Initiative. It's a program where you get a rebate uh, to put uh, panels on your roof, and then the panels are connected to your home, and then uh, the connection also goes to the grid so that your, the solar energy feeds your house first. And when you're not home in the daytime, then you have excess generation, that excess will go out into the grid. And when it does, it just pretty much covers this area. The traditional power plants, um, as somebody you saw f a photo of it is over here and it goes you know Utah Nevada you saw all over the place and then it travels all the substations and all this line so the, what we're I'm talking about is energy that is produced right here so we are on the same page um, so we talk about costs right oh costs are, are very uh, are hard um, and uh, it's cheaper to build power plants in the middle of nowhere because of the cost, you know, the nominal cost of energy is lower. But there are a lot of costs associated with getting you the energy to your, uh, to the loads. And those are not figured. Um, we, CalSIA, the California Solar Energy Industries Association, did a study on the feeding tariff program and we wanted to see, you know, what would be a, a reasonable price. Because one of the conditions on the bill is that the pricing, the utility has to be neutral as to whether it was bought from um, renewables or somewhere else. What, what we talked about in, in our case on uh, distributed generation is that if you had to, natural gas was built at your house, then you could say apples and apples. But since it's not, and it has to be transmitted, you have to incur all these costs. So the cost of the pricing of a DG system should be higher to, you know, and then we will be almost on the same level. And it may be even a little bit higher than the cost of uh, conventional energy, but my or argument um, is that, from Casillas' perspective, is that you're making an investment. The state is making an investment because, as you saw, prices coming down tremendously. The reason why they did was because there were markets out there doing you know, distributed generation mostly. There are some, um, a lot of uh, PV farms in Europe as well, Europe being the largest solar market, um, but 80% or more is usually on rooftops and uh, in, uh, in the distributed area. So the benefits, you know, you have the, the, uh, the, the clean energy, you alleviate congestion, because we were talking, uh, I heard all early today that there was an issue with transmission and uh, transmission lines. Well, you don't need to build a whole a line that goes from here to here, right? Because the energy is built here. Building this line costs a lot of money. In fact, in Texas, we do a lot of uh, off-grid projects for you know wealthy families in Dallas, let's say, because they have a ranch or something. But getting the line to go to their home is like forty thousand dollars per mile, or and that's just for you to have access to energy. So solar is is cheaper, uh, no matter what, in those scenarios. 
So you also have a uh, cost of volatility because the energy is free. Um, the cost of capital that you incur is the equipment and the installation. It creates local high-tech jobs so that you go basically beyond just energy. But you have, and, and the question I was asking earlier about jobs in the study was because before the solar initiative passed in 2006, we, there were like about 400 companies doing business in the state. Now, the, you, know, you can go to the website, um, gosolarcalifornia.org, and it, it's just, the count was at 4,000 at some point, and granted most of these, 80% of these are probably, you know, uh, companies that are mom and pop or below 10 or be below 25 employees per company, which, you know, speaks to the small businesses in the communities. And the, one of the reasons that is, is, is good for the communities is because if you're here in LA, you're not gonna call somebody in San Diego to come and install your system. You're going to look in the neighborhoods and the jobs. So in, in production, you know, if you want a factory, the average pr uh, uh, wage will be like about $10 an hour. This is for the majority of the workers. And then you have your engineers and then you have like, you know. But in, this, in the installation of solar energy, the, the wages range anywhere from $10 to like $500 an hour. Because in some of these cases, you have to you know, employ attorneys to do the, your contracts and things like that. So, um, and, and there is very um, skilled worker is what you need. You don't need somebody that you're gonna train on the line for a week. You need somebody that has gone to school that knows engineering, knows transmission, and, and, and knows, understands how to do interconnection and things like that. So, um, and uh, it, it reduces depending on imported fuels so that the energy is, pr is procured at the community, and you don't have to, you know, pay or import it from anywhere else. And then um, it, it improves security because of the decentralization. You have a huge power plant. So UCLA did a study on the feeding tariff, and uh, we also heard about uh, competitive solicitations and, uh, and things like that. And, and, and the cost, and, and one of the things that I found fascinating, because for a long time, I did not like the feeding tariffs. In a feeding tariff, is a tariff, it's set tariff, that you know, somebody asks, how do you know the price? Well, the, uh, outside the United States, in the world, what we know a feeding tariff is the government or the uh, util uh, or commission would say, would do an analysis of what is the cost of this technology at this point, and uh, they, would say this is the price per kilowatt hour so that anybody, grandma at the kitchen table can do, you know, a, uh, you don't need a spreadsheet even, you, you, you can just figure it out. Like if, if I pay this much and I get this much for so many years, this is my payback. So that has been what ha uh, the uh, policy and program that has uh, made solar energy a huge market and industry worldwide. Um, so UCLA did a study because the LA Business Council that has, they have businesses in LA, I mean in, in DWP and also in SoCal Edison, they were um, talking to about what if we had a feeding tariff because maybe uh, net metering, which is a, uh, the CSI program, um, you, you set at your home and then your meter runs backwards when, uh, um, when you're generating energy from solar and then at night your meter runs uh, forward when you're taking from the grid and not using the solar in your home. That, for some businesses, that doesn't work, especially if you have a, a warehouse that's empty most of the time, or that you have a business park and you lease your buildings, so you don't have your own load. So if you wanna make an invest investment, for you is, you prefer something where you sell the energy to the utility. So the only way that we knew about how to do this, this is about two years ago, was it, that we started this, pro this uh, study, um, it was, well, we have to uh, do it through a feed-in tariff. Uh, mind you, at that time, we knew about the reverse auctions. The concern that uh, some of the business owners had with the reverse auction is, you know, the uncertainty, like we don't know what the price is and who's gonna be doing it and what if this guy, you know, underbids a contract and then cuts corners and compromises my roof. So there were a lot of issues about that. So we looked at what can we do? So when UCLA did the study, it was uh, a very conservative, was in my mind, in my opinion, too conservative, but they were thinking 600 megawatts for the LADWP district uh, uh, region. And the prices were like on average about 25 cents per kilowatt hour. 
So they had, you know, about 34 cents for homes up to 10 kilowatts, and then, they, but the um, the majority of the systems they were looking at were more in in the 100 kilowatt or above because of uh, the uh, the business uh, orientation of it. But and here is a tariff that goes for it's a 20 year it's a 20 year contracts at, at the set price, and the tariff remains almost almost the same. Well, it goes down over time, so. But it's it's a kind of a flat fee that energy the utility is buying energy at. So there is no, you know, the utility knows exactly what it's going to cost them in the next 20 years. And then what they uh, UCLA did the study, and what UCLA um, was looking at uh, was the Luskin Luskin School and um, part of the Anderson School of Business. So they said, well, assuming that um, they had different scenarios of how much the Fuel, uh, fuel costs will go up, and that because AWP had to, you know, um, uh, cut down on the use of coal and in different and other scenarios. So what what I noticed was that these are the costs going up, and different the, the different levels depending on the fuel mix and what happens. And then here is the tariff. So right here, from here on, this is the lowest case. The the yeah lowest. Uh, um, Increase in in, um, in cost. You see that this after year like ten between year ten and fourteen, there is a break even for the utility. And after that is all. And I don't want to say the utility is making this profit, but the ratepayers are making this profit mm -hmm. because then you know um, your the pr the prices are below what the conventional cost of energy. And that's happening in Germany as we speak right now. Actually, one of the issues they have is that the prices of fossil fuel have come down. Um, with the feeding tariff, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about Germany in a minute. But so UCLA also did a study on what is the potential, and this is the rooftop potential that was like prime, and they came out with uh, a 19, point, 19 gigawatts. Now the governor is talking about let's do 12 gigawatts, and we're kind of going well. Let's use which I'm, I'm not, I'm disagreeing with some of my very esteemed colleagues in the uh, utility about let's let's count what we already have. I'm like, no, wait a minute, this is new stuff, but we'll see how we, we come out. The point is, is that 12 gigawatts, oh, sorry, please, LA can do it. Hmm. And this is a statewide program, it's, you know, the governor's program, the 12 gigawatts. So why, why do we have to go and count this CSI program, all the procurement that's going on right now, all the installations that are out right now? We could do this. And this is just rooftops. We're not talking about parking lots or anything else. And uh, Germany, this is what I wanted to get to, you know, 80% uh, of the projects are below one megawatt. And um, here you have the sweet spot would be between 10 kilowatts and 100 kilowatts. It's the majority of the projects in Germany. In Germany, last year, and I was, I was there in August when they hit the 20% uh, RPS, they had about 17 gigawatts of solar PV um, installed, and their program, unlike the CSI, where people use the energy first and then only a little bit goes out, out into the grid, 100% of the rooftops go into the grid. If you put a system on your roof, you don't use it yourself. None of it, zero. You interconnect to the utility grid. The utility is a must-take contract, which means you, the utility must take it no matter what. And there is no like, you know, here we're debating on where is a good place? What about this, this transmission or, 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 or this substation? It's not a good place. There is like, regardless. So if I have a contract and my substation is, fill, is full and, I, and the utility just cannot take anything, the utility is going to say yes, but we have to do the, uh, um, the retrofit. We have to do the upgrade. So that automatically, and most of the time is what I understand the developer or the installer would just go away because they don't want to wait for it because it's a race to install. In California, we have a race to just bid and stop because we have 18 months to build a project. So 40% dropout. In, in it, last year, they installed seven gigawatts of mostly rooftops. This year, they're really nervous because it's just too much. They're overheating the market. So what they decided to do, like they're thinking about it, and I am not 100% sure if they came up with a decision, but to stop doing feeding tariffs for uh, projects uh, above 10 megawatts. So they want to focus on only rooftops. Now, 
Italy had a problem two years ago where their market overheated, and they immediately what they did is just stop, and everything that uh, most of the the projects now going are just rooftops. Because the part partly is they want the energy, which is it's counterintuitive, don't you think? If the bigger plants are cheaper, why is Europe and now Japan just focusing on the rooftops and, and the distributed generation? Partly is the economy, right? Partly is the jobs. But I wonder if part of it is not also the cost of bringing the uh, energy into the load pockets and also uh, you know, distribution, maintenance, and transmission lines and all of that. So I really don't know. Um, in terms of cost, people are criticizing Europe. Spain did it wrong. Okay, Spain is an outlier as to the rest of Europe. Uh, Spain used a feeding tariff, and the feeding tariff was paid by the government out of the treasury, which is completely crazy. Germany is they used the uh, uh, was utility, just like here, like CSI program, like the procurements that the utilities are doing. So it's based on the um, uh, the customers of electricity. So when I was there last year, my understanding was from you know working uh, talking with the government and and, and people in the that maintain the grid and all, it, it was a whole week of meetings there, and they my understanding is that they were paying the customers the ratepayers in Germany were paying three euros a month. The way they do this is um, the utilities buy it's a must take, but it's a very competitive market. They have thousands of utilities. You can overnight just change your utility for the next 24 hour period. It's not a big deal. Not very many people do it, but it's available. And the utilities buy it, and they have the average uh, price. So the, the tariff, like it was 25 cents, I think is going down to 17 probably in June. But it was like 25 cents last year, or th th this year. So it goes from you know the wholesale price which for you know anywhere from four to uh, 12, 15 cents. So the delta is what's put on the ratepayers. The ratepayers pay for that. And the feeding tariff that I'm talking about is not just solar. That's the other thing that we are not really doing well here. And this is countrywide, not statewide. And I had these discussions in Texas as well. It's like, this is why the Germans made it happen with $3, three euros a month, is that they included wind and solar when they set up the feeding tariff in 2000, 2002, and they had wind, they were paying four cents per kilowatt hour, solar they were paying 50, five zero cents per kilowatt hour. But remember, they only get two hours of sun. They have the weather of uh, Juneau, Alaska. <laughs> and they don't have any tax credits. They don't have any perks that, like we do in addition to the state incentives. So then solar has been the, um, the tariff that has been decreasing uh, the farthest, but the, the fastest. But then they have also the other technologies in between. So when you have that and you have a portfolio, then the total package comes a lot cheaper. And I think that in California, we do have a lot of solar, we have some uh, wind and biomass. If we could bundle this and make one program that is comprehensive, and then yes, I agree that we need, we need all of the above. I am not against the large scale, and I think that we should use everything. And if we can get economies of scale, then great. But if you combine that with DG, I think our, our price should come out. I mean, there is no logic that would dictate otherwise. I mean, it's, been, it's proven. So um, I really encourage us <laughs> to think beyond large scale and kilowatt hour pricing. So the conclusion is that we really need to look at the local communities for the RPS and that um, I really think that 12 gigawatts of rooftop, it's completely doable. And, and again, we talked about today 300 megawatts we've installed in California, I mean, in SoCal Edison. Germany installed seven gigawatts. Japan is a, is a market that is very similar to ours in that they do, uh, when you put a, a PV system, you use it first and then you put out the excess. They are installing a, a, a gigawatt a year and they have entire communities that are built just from the get-go, all solar, all PV. Now, we should really study those because if they're not having issues with you know, transmission and distribution, or if they are, we haven't heard about, I, I would like to know. And now I mean that. I would like to know like, what are the issues that you're having with the transmission and distribution, and um, how can we learn the lessons? So um, I think that the communities 
in, in, in Japan too, the ma market traditional has been at three kilowatts, up to three kilowatts, so it's 100% residential. And they have like about seven gigawatts installed. The last two years they've been doing a gigawatt a year, I don't know how many, I forgot. And uh, the benefits you know, go beyond um, RPS, they go into the economic development. And, but what we do need is the transparency. We need, um, this is why the pricing, knowing the price is important. I'm sorry, but you know, it's like when you don't know, if you, if Sokal Edison did the RAM, the reverse auction, and there were seven, uh, seven um, companies or seven contracts awarded out of uh, 50 or something. Uh, PG&E in the north had like 200 bidders and they took four contracts. What kind of market is that? I mean, do we want to market? I imagine if Germany and the rest of the, the world, Japan and even China now, decided to go that route instead of what they did with the feeding tariff, we would have this lowering of the cost that we had in the last couple of years? I doubt it. Because and now, and now and I'm saying this even though <laughs> I'm suffering the consequences because what we have in the market right now is, you know, we're talking about uh, Chinese companies coming in and losing money and reducing costs, and we're like, ah. So there is going to be a shakeout in the industry, no question. So if you're thinking of buying, uh, installing your system, really look carefully as to the supplier, because you want to make sure that they're going to be around to respond to a 25-year warranty. Uh, and that's going to be interesting now, because now it's a race at the bottom. But you know, I think it's going to be good, because then we are going to be smarter about it, and, and hopefully we're going to stay on the low end of the pricing. So um, let's build on the success of the solar initiative. Look at the lessons learned there. I think we can replicate those into the uh, wholesale market in the communities.